Hello everyone and welcome to the fifth and the second last webinar of the season at the 17th Social Entrepreneurship for Innovation in Health course. We'll just take a pause for a minute for everyone to join. Those of you who are already able to see us, please post a comment in the discussion forum requesting your peers to refresh their screens. And also please don't forget to take the uh, uh, survey that you can find below the screen that asks you are you watching us live? Please click yes. By now you know you get extra credit points to watch live webinars. Okay, let's get started. We'll continue our discussion from last week around co-creation and this time with focus on idea pitching and development as the theme of, the, of this week's module. We are all set to learn some good tips from our guest expert for today. But before we dive into our conversation, please don't forget to take the survey that I just spoke about. Also, please don't forget to drop your question for our guest expert in the discussion forum. And also just a reminder on assignments. Thank you to those who have already made the submissions for module four and those who are in the process, please expedite the submissions so that we can review them. Also this week, you have the assignments coming up for module five. So we look forward to reviewing them as well. And now it is my pleasure to welcome our guest expert for today, Mr. Mark Shang, who is Ashoka's leadership, who is in position of Ashoka's leadership and capacity of senior advisor. He is the pioneer of social finance, an investment banker turned author and social business coach. Mark has facilitated over $300 million of investment, over 100 social ventures. Mark recently founded Social Innovation Circle, that is a platform to empower social innovators with tools and support to scale their systems changing innovation. His coaching services bridges the knowledge gap around access to finance, finance and pitching for them. Mark has been in the forefront of social innovation for now a couple of decades. Today, Mark is going to present us a workshop on the life cycle of a social business. We will get great insights to learn and apply in our professional life from this session. So keep your notepad and pen handy to take down some good pointers from this workshop. Welcome, Mark, and thank you so much for joining us today. We're truly delighted to have the opportunity to learn from you. Thank you so much, Indrani. It's always a pleasure to come back on this course, and uh, I'm really looking forward to today. Thank you. Great. Mark, before we dive into our workshop, a quick question. Would you please share a little bit about your journey of uh, being a social uh, you know, uh, investment banker to your motivation of working in the social entrepreneurship space? Uh, sure. Uh, so I, I, I've been working in finance for uh, just over 20, 25 years, and I uh, never thought I would actually be working in the social enterprise space in particular. Um, so I, I, when I left university, um, I'm not even sure that such a concept existed at that time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I spent the first uh, 10 or so years of my career uh, working uh, in an investment bank, um, doing project lending for different types of, of, of venture. And then about 15 years ago, um, I, I moved away from that and began to explore the area of social innovation and social enterprise. And through organizations like Ashoka, I, I was introduced to a wide number of entrepreneurs and indeed intrapreneurs who were trying to bring to market uh, social business concepts, you know, products that would serve people at the base of the pyramid, products that would improve healthcare for people earning less than $2 a day. And, and, and one of the things that I realized at that time was that there was a huge need for finance professionals to support such entrepreneurs um, mm -hmm. and entrepreneurs, uh, because this market of, of social impact uh, was, has really only grown in the last 10 years and, and, and is a very new concept. So what I've been doing uh, uh, for the, for, uh, over that period of time is both helping founders to raise capital uh, mm -hmm. as well as support, supporting them and by myself being an investor. And, and so I've invested in a wide number of different enterprises um, over this time. And in the last few years, uh, what I've realized is that um, a lot of that knowledge is actually very shareable. And so I've been trying through courses like this and through courses that I run to uh, communicate more of the knowledge um, for founders and also for entrepreneurs about how to raise capital, how to pitch your idea. And, and so that's why it's such a pleasure to join courses like this and to, and to share this workshop today. Great, thank you, Mark, for sharing your journey. And we are so excited to now hear from you about the life cycle of social businesses and how we can pitch at different stages of the life cycle. So floor is all yours. 
Okay, fantastic. Well, let me just quickly share my screen. Uh, let me know uh, the moment you can see this, and hopefully that has now appeared on your screen. Is that is that right? Yes. Yes, you yep. can see your screen. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak for about forty minutes um, on a framework which I've been working with many, many social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs over the last 10 years um, <clears throat> to help them raise capital. And uh, the framework is called the life cycle of a social business. Uh, uh, and it really applies whether you are raising funding for a social venture or indeed whether you're raising funding for an entrepreneurial project, okay? Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't really matter uh, whether you are an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. I know most people on this call are entrepreneurs, uh, but essentially this is all about giving you a tool that will enable you to successfully bring a new product or service that creates social impact into the world, right? And, uh, and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, hopefully uh, your audience will find it um, helpful. But certainly for the clients that I've worked with, and I've worked with several hundred around the world in, in different contexts, including healthcare and education and so forth, um, this framework is possibly the most powerful toolkit that we've got uh, in our intellectual sort of, you know, framework uh, for sharing with entrepreneurs uh, how to raise capital. Okay, And why is this framework uh, so powerful? I think it's because what it does is enables um, uh, you to avoid the three classic mistakes that any social entrepreneur or entrepreneur trying to bring a product or service to market tends to make, okay? So uh, over the last 15 years, I've observed hundreds of teams trying to do this, uh, what, what your, you know, people on this call are trying to do, which is to bring new ideas into the world. And there are three very, very common uh, uh, mistakes that people make. And, uh, and those three mistakes are, number one, building a product that no one wants, okay? Uh, so how many times have we gone and invested millions of dollars, developed a product, tried to sell it, and guess what? No one wants to buy it, okay? So that's a very, very easy mistake to make. And it, it, it results because the entrepreneurs don't quite understand the process that they're going through. So, so I'm going to give you a framework to help you avoid that number one mistake. The number two mistake is scaling a product before you are ready to scale, okay? So what I want to try and show you is that there is a sequence to how you bring a product or service to market. And, and, and there is no point in running before you can walk, okay? So you have to do certain things before you start to think about scale and reaching millions of people, okay? And finally, um, a very, very common mistake is pitching to the wrong funder at the wrong stage of development, okay? So I've seen countless social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs uh, try to pitch for VC funding, and they're in the earliest stage of their project when, when that just it doesn't make any sense at all, right? So there's a certain type of funder who funds you at different stages of development, and I want to show you who those funders are and when they come in and when's the right time to talk to them. Because if you get that wrong, you're speaking to the wrong person for the wrong idea. So, so this framework will, will capture all three of these mistakes and prevent you from making them. And if, if, if that's the case, we can probably avoid 90% of the reasons why people fail when they, when they come to market. So that's why I think this framework is so powerful. Okay? It, it, it avoids 90% of the mistakes that people make, a very avoidable mistakes. Um, that, that prevent them from coming to market, okay? So, so those are the three mistakes we're gonna try and avoid. And the way that we're gonna do it is by understanding the three phases that I think every social innovation goes through. <laughs> so let's talk about the three phases in the life cycle of a social business or a social venture. So the way to think about this is that imagine the three phases of water, which every, everyone's familiar with, right? So when water is very cold, it's solid, and you've got the phase which we call ice. Then as the temperature rises, it melts and you get liquid water. And then as it crosses 100 degrees Celsius, it becomes gas and vapor and you get steam, right? And what's interesting about that process of the three phases is that each one looks completely different from the other, right? You can't mistake them. And the transition from one phase to the other happens at a very specific moment and when it crosses, everything changes, right? You know, the nature of the, of, of the product, 
how it's working, how it interacts with the environment and so forth, right? And so what I want to share with you uh, in, uh, in today's workshop is that a business goes through exactly the same kind of phase transition. And so if you understand the three phases that I'm about to describe, you will have a much, much clearer sense on what is happening at each phase, what you're supposed to be doing in each phase, and what are the goals and opportunities of each phase, right? In order to be able to optimize your activity for that phase, okay? So what are the three equivalent phases of a social innovation or a social business concept? I think that we can break out three phases, which I'm gonna call prototype, commercialize, and then scale, okay? Mm -hmm. So each of these three phases represents a distinct phase in the development of your service or your goods that the, uh, you're trying to bring to market. And each one is completely different, completely different from the other phases. And so if you understand what phase you're in and what you're doing, you're gonna have a huge, huge advantage uh, in avoiding any of the mistakes that, that people typically make. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna to describe to you in detail each phase in the life cycle of a social business, okay? And, and, and the way that I'm gonna do it is by pointing out the differences in each phase. And each phase is different in its own unique way. Each phase will have a different goal or an objective that you are trying to achieve in that phase. Each phase will have a different activity that you are just trying to, to, to work on in that phase, right? Each phase will have a different way to organize your team. So your team will actually change from phase to phase, who the people are, what they do, how they're organized. It's all gonna change, okay? And finally, there is a different funder for each phase as well. So it, the, the people who fund the prototype stage are not the same people who fund the scaling up phase, okay? And, and so it's very important for you to know which phase you're in so that you can make the right pitch to the right funder or the right backer, okay? Uh, and, and, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through these phases. We're gonna look at each, each of these goals, activities, teams, and funders, and we're gonna talk about the differences between them, all right? Okay, so, um, and Indrani, uh, please feel free to uh, ask me questions that come up for people in the chat. Uh, uh, write your questions uh, for Indrani to, to collect. We're gonna stop at each point in each, at each stage of the journey so that uh, we have a little conversation so that we don't leave anyone behind. So, so uh, uh, you know, for those of you who are listening, uh, don't, don't panic. Uh, we're gonna have plenty of time to discuss this as we go. And we're gonna leave some time at the end to discuss this as well, okay? So let's just dive straight in. Uh, and actually, and Johnny, are there any questions already coming up or, or shall we just go straight? In it? my mind, a lot of questions are already popping up, but I already see you answering uh, some of them already. So I'll wait for you to complete this first stage. Okay, fantastic. Let's go for it. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about the prototype stage. Okay, so this is for any entrepreneur who is, uh, hasn't yet developed the product. Uh, or the service, and you're thinking about how to do it, how to launch, where do you start, okay? So you start with building a prototype. You start with basically coming up with a conceptualization of what it is that you wanna do. And uh, the right way to think about this is this is the inventor in the lab, okay? So you, you, you are an inventor. And in the prototype stage, your first job is to invent a product that works, okay? So um, it's not about scaling up. Don't worry about reaching a million customers. Just try to invent a product that works. And uh, I think there are really two questions that you want to answer in the prototype stage, okay? So the first one, and, and I'm assuming here that everyone is a social innovator, uh, is which product or mm -hmm. service best solves the social problem that you are working on? So, you know, whether you to find a problem in healthcare, like how can people get more affordable healthcare or how can we improve diabetes uh, 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 primary care for customers in Rwanda or whatever it might be, it could be you know, very specific, uh, et cetera. You're gonna have a social problem in mind. You're gonna have a target customer or beneficiary in mind and you have to work out what product or service are you gonna provide to them, right? So that's, that's number one question. What product or service best solves the social problem that you're working on? Mm -hmm. And then the next question you want to answer is, is anybody out there willing to pay for that product or service, right? So these are the two questions you have to answer in the prototype stage, right? If you can't answer those two questions, nothing else matters, right? You're not going to progress beyond this stage. So the, the key to doing the prototype stage is to keep it very lean, 
You don't want to invest millions of dollars building a product and trying to sell it, right? Before you've tested this with some beta customers, with some initial people that you're trying to help and go, here's a prototype of what I'm trying to do, right? Does it actually solve the problem that you are concerned about? And if they say, yes, this works and we like it, the next question is, would you be willing to pay for it, right? Or would somebody be willing to pay for it, mm -hmm. right? And if the answer to that is no, you have to go back to the drawing board because you haven't got, you haven't answered the most basic question, which is, is someone willing to pay for it? Okay. So what I'm going to do is actually each stage, each phase of the life cycle actually has two critical steps to, the, to, to that, right? So I'm going to call the first step impact validation, mm -hmm. and I'm going to call the second step customer validation. So impact validation is all about answering that first question which product or service best solves the social problem that I'm trying to work on, right? And then the customer validation is, now that I know which product or service is the best one the customers want, is any customer willing to pay for it, okay? And what I recommend to the, the entrepreneurs that I work with and the entrepreneurs that I work with is don't try to answer both of these questions at the same time. Split them out into a sequence and answer the first question first uh, before you progress to the second question, okay? So don't try and put those two things together because if you do that, you will have too many variables to juggle with, right? You, will, you, you, you have a great idea and guess what? No one wants to buy it, okay? So if that's the case and you run a pilot and, and, and you make no sales, if you conflate those two things together, you won't know the reason why you failed. Right. You won't know whether it was because it was a great idea, but people couldn't afford it at the price you were selling or whether it was a, it was a terrible idea and therefore people weren't going to buy it anyway. Right. So what you want to do is you want to before you actually sell the product in the market, you want to run a prototype phase where you basically try out lots of different products and services and you basically get in front of a small group of beta customers, if you want, and you give it to them for free. Okay, and you say, please try my prototype and give me feedback on this prototype. So the right? customers that you're talking about is really the customers you're going to be using the product, not the investors. Uh, sorry, you know, you're absolutely right. So, so I'm not talking about people to invest, okay? Uh, and, and that actually is, is a major, major problem <laughs> or mistake which people make. Mm -hmm. What they do is they build a prototype and they show it to their investors, right? Mm -hmm. And what they say to the investors is, will you invest in this so I can show it to a customer, right? That's the wrong way around. What you want to do is you want to build a prototype and show it to a customer first. Mm -hmm. And then you say to the customer, does this actually satisfy your, your, your needs, right? And if the customer says, no, it doesn't, then, then don't even bother. Stop, go back to the drawing board and come up with a better product or idea, right? And, yeah. and so for the, the sequence is customer first. Don't try and charge for it. Don't try and, uh, uh, you know, and, and work out what the commercial uh, proposition is. Just say, do you think this works, right? And then as long as you get enough people saying, yes, I, you know, I think that that product actually helps me, then you ask the question, and if I was to build this product, would you buy it from me at a, at a, at a price point? You know, tell me what you think it's worth. And if they say, no, I'm not going to buy it, then, then you have to go back and you have to try again. And if they say, yes, I would buy that, I would pay $20 a month for it. Um, now you have now satisfied the prototype stage. Okay, so, so that's, the, that's the gatekeeping. Uh, that enables you to know that you finished the prototype stage is when a customer says to you, I've tried your product for free for six months. I really like it. If you could sell it to me for $10 a month, I would buy it. Okay. And, and that is the validation that you need. That, that, so you first, you validate whether the customer wants it. And then secondly, you validate whether they will pay for it. And if you can do those two things, congratulations, you passed the prototype stage. You are now ready to move on to the next stage, which we call commercialization. And at that point, you're ready to go to funders for it, okay? So the first stage, you don't talk to investors. You just get out there with the most basic minimum product and you just ask customers for free, if I build this, would you, like, would you buy it? And, and that way you won't spend millions of dollars testing something that nobody wants. So, so, so break out the prototype stage into these two aspects, the impact validation phase and the customer validation phase, and you will massively increase your chance of success without having spent too much money. Okay, so let me just give you an example. Let me give you a, uh, an example of a healthcare uh, company that uh, goes through all the three stages that I'm about to describe to you or that I am describing to you right now. 
And because I, I, I don't want to tread on anyone's toes or expose anyone's business plan, what I've done for the purposes of this workshop is I just made up a company, okay? Uh, so I'm going to give you a theoretical example, but okay. it is based on literally dozens and dozens of clients that I've worked with who have gone on to raise tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in, in finance. And I've seen them do this from the earliest ideation stage all the way through to the multi-country international stage, right? Um, so, uh, so I've taken a few business models, I've disguised the name, I've amalgamated them together, <laughs> and I'm going to walk you through, through them as an example. And the company that I'm, I've picked uh, is an insurance company in, in South Asia, uh, and it's called Healthy Sure. okay? Uh, I just made up the name, and, and the logo uh, uh, has been created by my colleague Anshul Magotra. Uh, who's just magicked it up out, out of nowhere uh, 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 in the last uh, couple of hours just for us today. So <laughs> this is the first time we've ever tried this, uh, uh, this case study, but, but let's, uh, let's see how, how you, you find it. So imagine that there is a, a, a major multinational company called Health Sure, and it's a number one player in the insurance space, okay? And because most people on this call are entrepreneurs, um, I'm going to give you the example from an entrepreneur's perspective. So let's assume that there is uh, an executive within the Healthy Sure team uh, that uh, is keen to be a social entrepreneur. And what they want to do is they want to, within um, the operations of Healthy Sure, they want to develop a new product or a service that can serve uh, the poor to create social impact. Okay. So, so, and what they're going to do is they're going to test an idea, they're going to sell it to their investment committee or to their internal team. And they're going to try and build a product or a service using the, scap the capabilities of, help of their company in order to be able to bring a new social impact product or service to market. Okay, so how might they go about the prototype stage? Well, the first thing is you have to pick a problem. You have to pick a social problem that you care about or that you want to make a dent in. And one of the things that uh, this executive uh, has realized is that in the many countries in which they operate, there is one country in particular that has a very high need uh, for insurance. Uh, and that country is Bangladesh, let's say. I'm just picking an example here. And one of the things that they've noticed is that uh, there's a very large section of the population in Bangladesh that live in remote rural areas, okay? Mm -hmm. And a significant portion of them are what we might call smallholder farmers. Uh, they are farmers who uh, live in rural areas, farming small plots of land, they typically don't have a very high income um, and they typically are not insurance clients currently, okay? So uh, they're, they're missing a lot of financial products because, uh, and as a result of that, they're, they're, their livelihoods suffer and they're not being served by, by, by this company or indeed many other companies uh, in, in the financial products space. So, you know, there is a missing market essentially for this product right, uh, for this company. And so the entrepreneurial team says, let's identify rural farmers in Bangladesh as our new target customer base. Can we create a product or a service for them that is both impactful and also commercial, right? It has to be a business and it has to be profitable, right? But at the same time, it must be impactful because we're doing this because we really genuinely want to do something good, right? So can we create a win-win situation here where there's a new product, uh, uh, but, but something which actually makes sense given that this is an insurance company, right? We don't want to be doing like, you know, a cafe or something, right? You, you want to use the skills and expertise of your organization to create something impactful, right? So let's go through the prototype phase with them. What they're going to do is they're going to say, what are we good at? So we're good at providing insurance products, right? So let's stick, to the, let's stick to what we know, which insurance product, you know, best fits the needs of a rural farmer in our target country, which is Bangladesh, right? You know, we provide life insurance. Do they need life insurance? We provide pensions. Do they need a pension product? We do health insurance. Do they need health insurance, right? So they, collect, they look at all the existing things that they've got and they're trying out new ideas, new ideas, new ideas. Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this, right? And literally what they do is they get a small group of their target customer base together 
And they go out to them and they ask them these questions. You know, if I offered you health insurance, would you like it? If I offered you a pension so you could save long term, right? Would that help you? Would that, and so on and so on. So the prototype stage is all about experimentation. It's all about invention. It's all about coming up with ideas and seeing and asking a customer, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, does this work? Does this work? Does this work? Right. It is not about creating a business plan. Okay. So if you create a business plan where you come up with an idea and you say, my idea is X and, and, and I'm going to project that we're going to try and reach 1 million customers with product X in the next five years. Right. Um, you know, you're wasting your time. And the reason you're wasting your time is because the first thing you should be doing is forget the business plan, just get in front of 50 farmers, right? And ask them what they want based on your you know, expertise, right? Because the answers will totally blow your mind. They will totally surprise you what they say, right? And you cannot predict it in advance, okay? So, you know, my mentor, um, uh, uh, Paul Polnack, you know, I uh, said, do not even think about getting into the market until you've spoken to 100 potential customers of your product, right? And he was very, very clear on this, 100 customers, right? And, and, I, and I, so, so, so literally, you, that's what you've got to do. You've got to ask them what, what they want. So imagine that our entrepreneurs get together, they go to Bangladesh, they go to these villages, they start talking to farmers and they're saying, what insurance product makes sense for you? Is it life insurance, Is it health insurance, you know? And guess what? The answer they get back from the farmers is, we don't need any of your products. We don't want your health insurance. We don't want your pension. I got no money to save, right? How can I possibly be, be putting money into a pension, right? I don't even want life insurance because that's so far ahead in the future. I can't even think one, you know, one week ahead, right? The only thing that really might help me would be crop insurance, right? Because that directly affects my livelihood today. Mm -hmm. So if you could offer me some kind of insurance that would make it so that when it rains and I, my crop is wiped out, uh, I, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I can be protected. You have just changed my life, right? And nobody provides crop insurance, right? So, so, so this is a request from the customers based on the feedback coming from the entrepreneurs to create a new product that does not exist at all, but is directly linked to the expertise of the team, right? And they didn't know that this was the magic answer, right? And they wouldn't know that until they'd been out and done that. So impact validation is a very, very important phase, right? Um, uh, before you do anything, go out to your customers, talk to them, come up with the answer, it will surprise you what it is. I guarantee you, it'll be as left field as this, right? So they go away and they, and they come back and the answer is, is we got to develop a crop insurance product, okay? So, uh, so, so, so they, that's what they do. They, they go away and they come up with a, a product for crop insurance, right? And so they've now, and so that is what overwhelmingly is the impact validation, right? Uh, after several months of trial and error, they realize it's not health insurance, it's not pensions, it's not life insurance we've got to create crop insurance, right? So what they then do is they then build a prototype of what a crop insurance product looks like. And they go out to the farmers again, and they ask more questions. Okay, so which crops do you want me to insure? How much coverage do you need? Uh, what, what, what kind of, 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 of weather event uh, do, do you need me to guarantee against? Is it frost? No, it's not frost, it's rain. Okay, what kind of rain? The monsoon rain, but not this and that. And so you get into this incredible detail about the prototyping, right? And again, you don't try and create it for yourself. You literally do this in conversation with farmers, right? Or, or customers, right? Um, uh, to come up with this, with, with, with this product. And they will totally surprise you with their, their, with their knowledge. You know, oh, don't worry about the frost. That's never been an issue for us, but I've, ro I've lost my crop a hundred times from, from a bad rain. Right. And so you, you, you in, the, in the prototype phase, you're already getting a lot of information about what you need. And so the final confirmation of success in the prototype phase is now that you've spoken to these farmers or these customers for six months. Right. And they've now told you what uh, what, what what they want and how they want it. You've got to ask them one final question. If I build this in the way that we've now confirmed or described, would you actually pay for this? And how much would you pay for this, right? Mm -hmm. And the magic number you want to hear is that 80% or, you know, of, of, your, of the people that you've been talking to for six months would say, yes, if you build that, I will pay for it and I can afford $20 a month or, or whatever the number is, right? And that's your validation. That's your customer validation for the first phase, okay? 
because then you know, okay, now there is a market and now somebody is saying, I will put my money where my mouth is right, and do that. And so the end of the prototype stage, before you think about commercialization is one customer says, I will convert, right? And, I, I, and, and it's somebody that you've been speaking to for six months and you've been basically building this product with them right, during that time. So let me just quickly pause there and, and, and Andrani, I don't know whether you have any thoughts or questions on, on the prototype stage before I move on to the next two stages. No, but I think the recap um, is that you fine tune your product, find your product, fine tune your product, and find your first one, two of the first few customers that you yes. can who can validate this. That's so, right. um, so the way we will be pitching our product is to this customer and not investors. But how do we finance this stage, Mark? Okay, well, I am so glad you asked. Um, so, so <laughs> I've got a great slide on that. But let, let's just quickly talk about uh, what kind of team you, you actually know. Let's just go straight to it. Um, so basically, in the prototype stage, um, when it's only an idea and you don't actually have a customer, and you don't actually have a product yet, right? Uh, there's a very, very small group of funders who will actually give you any kind of backing for this idea. And really, there's only three. Um, so the first one is what we call the bootstrap, which is basically it's you, okay? <laughs> You have to reach into your own pocket <laughs> and, and fund it yourself, right? And that's what many, many entrepreneurs do. Um, if you are an entrepreneur, you have to ask your employer to uh, give you some R&D budget to experiment with. And so it's, it's your organization that does this. And sometimes you are able to go out to what we call friendly friends and family, which is basically uh, people who know you quite well and would be willing to give you a small sum of money because it's you, not because of the idea or the product, because there isn't a product at this stage, who is willing to invest in you, right? So the prototype stage is not possible to raise a great deal of money because there isn't a lot of money out there. You're too mm -hmm. early stage, you're too high risk, it's just too early, right? So normally this requires self-funding. This requires uh, whether, whether that means your organization does it because you're an entrepreneur, you do it yourself because you're just passionate about bringing this to market, or you get a small group of friends and people who know you how to do this, you know, to do it. But that, that's pretty much it for that stage. And then finally, I said I would tell you what kind of what kind of team do you need to build. So everyone in your team in the prototype stage is basically um, an, an inventor in a lab, right? So so everyone is, is running these experiments. Oh, do they want crop insurance? Uh, no, they don't. They want life insurance or whatever it might be, right? What kind of crop insurance do they need? Uh, rice, not not corn. Uh, you know, uh, rain insurance, not frost, right? And so on, right? And, and so you're, you're running these experiments, you're asking your customer, and then based on the feedback, you're, you're developing a slightly better product, right? And you're still not there yet. You're not, you're not even commercializing this. You're not selling this at this stage, right? This is just mm -hmm. prototype. So, so that's the prototype stage. Let me then talk about the next phase, okay? So once you've graduated from the prototype stage, you've now got some early stage customers who say, yeah, if you build that, I, I, I will buy it, right? You're ready for the commercialization stage. And Sorry, Mark, I, uh, there is one more question for the prototyping stage. Can I just take it? Sure. Okay, great. So we've got uh, Peter Berg, and he's asking, what is essentially different for pitching for social innovation ideas compared to business innovation ideas? Okay, uh, very little. Uh, so a business idea is, 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 is the same, right? You, you, you're still pitching, here's a product or a service, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's going to be successful, right? The difference is that with social innovation, you have to emphasize more the social impact of the idea. So you have to actually got to jump through two hurdles, not just one. In the business, the only hurdle is, will this make money? In the social innovation idea, it is, does it actually solve the problem that I'm concerned about, whether that's diabetes or affordable healthcare or whatever it might be? And does it cover its cost, right? Would it actually be sustainable in itself? So social innovation is, is harder than purely commercial uh, in, uh, um, innovation uh, because you have these two targets, not just one. And, and, and so you, you need to really explain. Uh, and because the, the funders are typically impact funders, they're going to be asking some very tough questions about the social impact, right? You know, yes, it makes money, but, you know, does it actually help poor people? Does it actually help people with diabetes and, and so on and so on, right? So, so, so people will be very, uh, so, so there's that, that, that's really the main distinction between the two. Great. Okay, commercialization. So every single stage that I'm going to describe to you uh, can be broken down into two sub-stages, right? And commercialization is no, is no different. 
So the commercialization phase has two steps. The first step is what we might call customize. Okay. And what happens in a customization stage? Uh, uh, and the second phase is standardized, right? So, so stage one, first you customize your product. And then secondly, once you know what customers want, you standardize it, okay? You make it very, very standardized and uniform, okay? So again, break out your stages into these sub phases because by doing so, you will uh, progress much faster, okay? Paradoxically, uh, okay? So in the customized phase, what you're doing is you're just working with a handful of customers. You can't actually work with that many customers when you're customizing your product every single time for each customer anew, right? And, and what do I mean by customization? Well, basically what we're saying here is that first you have to work out what customers actually want. Because you know, in my crop insurance example, right, I, I, I know they want crop insurance, but that's just the first thing. There are actually five dimensions that you have to work out, at least uh, when you're bringing it to market. What's the price? What features do you need? How will you produce the product or service? How will you sell and market this product or service? And how will you distribute and deliver this product or service? Okay. So these five dimensions have to be worked out very, very carefully. All right. Uh, you know, what's the right delivery channel? What's the right marketing channel? What's the right production method? Do you want to outsource production or build it in-house? Uh, do they want this feature or that feature, et cetera, right? So there's a lot of variables you've got to juggle with, right? And you don't want to lock these variables down too quickly, right? You know, because otherwise there's very, very high risk that you get one of them wrong and then you're in deep trouble, right? You know, you build all these features and, and guess what? Nobody actually wants them. The only thing they mm -hmm. wanted was rice insurance for rain, okay? And you offered them crop, uh, uh, corn insurance and frost and all these things. Well, you just over-engineered a product that nobody wants, okay? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to work with five customers and customize each product exact for what that customer is going to make them super, super happy, right? And, 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 and only in that process of discovery through intense customization, do you actually work out what the market really needs and really wants, right? Um, and again, like the prototype stage, it, it's really going to surprise you what the answer is going to be. Um, you know, they don't want those features that you thought were amazing, but they really care about this one, right? Uh, you know, it's going to be too expensive to build it in, in, in Bangladesh, but import it from China, right? Uh, you thought that everyone wants to buy your crop insurance, uh, uh, you know, from a broker, right? But actually, the only way that you can sell the insurance is if you go door to door, all right? Because nobody uh, um, ha knows how to go to a broker, okay? So you just got to re. So if, if you're selling the crop insurance, you know, through a broker to rural farmers in Bangladesh, it's a great product, a great idea, but you just screwed up on your on your delivery channel, okay? So you can't work that out until you actually talk to a customer and they say, "I'm sorry, but I'm never going to go online and buy through a broker because I." I'm a farmer in Bangladesh and I don't do that, right? Um, so, 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 so customize first. Don't try and get to scale. Don't try and define your product and, and, and leave it at that. You've got to tailor it for every single customer afresh for the first five to 10 customers, right? And so that's what our healthy insurance company does. They go and talk to the farmers. They say, what do you want? How do you want me to sell this to you? Uh, do you want door-to-door -door sales and so on and so on? So they go through the same process. It's very similar to the prototype, but now you're actually working on the other dimensions of the product, right? How are you going to sell it? How are you going to produce it? And what customization will do, and you can only work with a handful of customers while you do this. It's too intense to do this with 100 customers, right? But, what, but it's so worth your time to do this because what it will reveal is insights that you could never find out again by doing it from a blank piece of paper, Right. You know, uh, and so what it will do is it will result in a far, far better product, you know, out of the gate uh, once you've actually gone through a customization phase. And so uh, in the case of our insurance company, they do they work with five customers and, you know, uh, and what they realize is that what the customers tell them is that they really want an app where they can uh, take a picture of the field in which they're growing crops. And, uh, and, and, and that will instantly um, uh, confirm to the insurance company whether the crops have been wiped out by rain or not, okay? And so that lowers the cost of insuring the product because you can validate and confirm whether the, you know, the, the, the insurable event has actually taken place or not. And previously, our entrepreneurial team 
assumed that they had to hire somebody to go and visit every field and confirm whether the whether event had taken place or not, right? And the farmer said, don't do that. I, I will never be able to pay for that. Uh, let me just take a picture and send it to you on WhatsApp. And, 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 and there you go. So that simple comment from their first three customers gave them the insight to come up with a great product, right? Which is mm -hmm. exactly tailored to the needs of their, of their customer. So they build the app and that is their, and that is their killer pro product from the customization phase. And once they've done this, you know, 10 times, right? And, and, and been through many iterations, only then, uh, you know, you know and, and your customers are telling you, I love this, you, 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 you literally built this for me, right? And that's actually true. For the first 10 customers, you built it exactly the way that they wanted, right? And so you're then ready to standardize this. You're, you're then ready to say, okay, now let me create uh, one version which the next 10,000 customers I can sell to, right? Because I don't have to worry anymore about tailoring it for them. Right, I know exactly exactly how they want the burger built, right, or the product or whatever it is. I'm now ready for, for mass scale and production, and so standardization follows on from customization, right? But you don't want to jump to this step too quick. You you want to go through that discovery phase, customize it first, right? Literally, you know, remember when the first cars were built, they were built hand built for individual customers before you can get to the Model T Ford and the assembly line, right? And it's exactly the same with every product. You've got to build it for your customers first before you can create a standardized version of that product, which you're ready for, for mass production, right? Uh, and, and, and what standardization enables you to do is to create consistency. So the, the test of consistency is, do, can you create a standard package that you can basically offer uh, to your customers? So just as Spotify, and I, I just literally just pulled this off the Spotify page, you know, says, you know, you can buy our individual package or our family package or our student package and so on, right? Eventually, you want to be able to create a set of standardized marketing brochure, right? That you can basically give to your customers and say, which one of these do you want? Do you want the family size or do you want the student version or do you want the individual version? But once you pick that package, there is no room to change it, right? There is no room to go, can I have the family version, but in red? You know, at that point, you can't do that when at scale because you can't customize it for customers at scale, right? So, you, so you have to first customize, then you can standardize, and then you're ready for, and then you're ready for scaling. Okay, so that's your mass production uh, 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 unlock, as it were. And so, what kind of team do you have in the standardization phase? Uh, sorry, in in the commercialization phase, right? Well, it's not the inventor in the lab anymore. It's now the jazz band, right? You know, everyone on your team is now an improviser who is working out exactly what, what melody will delight your customer. And once you've got the hit, you ask the jazz band to write down their music and, and create the score, okay? So first you have to create, you know, improvise and see what sticks. And then you ask them to, write, to actually give me the playbook, okay? They, they, the customers love that riff. What, you know, how can I now, uh, uh, you know, remember what you've just done? And who funds the commercialization phase? Well, again, there's a different type of funder, right? In fact, there are three types of funders for the commercialization phase. There are angels, right? Private individuals who uh, back ideas that are commercializing. There are funds, there are investment funds that specialize in the early stage, but not very many, actually, uh, uh, you know, in this what we call seed round investment. And finally, for those of you who are entrepreneurs, it's back to your organization again. So what you do is you go back to your committee and you say, the prototype phase worked. You know, the, we tried it with the farmers. They loved it. They said they would pay, pay for it if we built it. Will you now give me the funds to actually build it, right? And that is your uh, pitch to your investment committee as an entrepreneur is, is, is to your organization. So again, uh, and Johnny, I don't know whether there were any questions on, on, on the commercialized stage of the life cycle. So, um, Mark, just to remind you, we're just 15 minutes away from the end of the session. So very right. quickly, I will park my question for end of the sessions. But yeah, I, at some point, if you can also talk about how we can scout for some partners at different stages, but we can take okay. it later. Let, let's, 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 let's do that at the end, because I, I think we should yeah. have a little bit of a little bit more Q&A. So let me just quickly finish the last stage and then we'll, we'll just yeah. wrap this up and then we'll, we'll, sure. we'll go. Through. Okay. So, so standardization is basically, can you come up with a manual of, of, of uh, sorry, a marketing brochure of, of your standardized products to offer to customers? And if you can do that, you're, you're ready for the next phase, which is scaling up, right? Um, and so let's talk a bit about, okay, so now you've commercialized the product. Uh, you've now worked out exactly what package best fits the needs of as many 
customers as possible. Let's talk about scale. Um, and again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break out the scaling phase into two sub stages, okay? Uh, just to make it easy for you to, to manage each, each part of this. And I'm going to call those two phases mass production and social franchising, okay? Let's talk mass production. So the mass production is basically you now have got your product, you know the standardized version that will reach as many customers as possible. So it's the assembly line, okay? What you've got to do is now you've got to hire up, uh, staff up, produce more, okay? More factories, uh, more, more, more engineers, uh, more production, more salespeople, okay? <laughs> and, and, and basically you're just, be just doing more of it yourself, just growing it and growing it and growing it, okay? And so in the case of our insurance company, once they've got the crop insurance, they launch a hundred branches across Bangladesh, okay? And now they're really getting to scale, okay? And for many organizations, that actually might actually be, be the end game. This might actually be enough. You know, we've got a great product. We've gone through these different stages of evolution. We're ready for, we're ready for scale. We're going to launch it nationwide, and we're going to do it ourselves and become the number one player in the crop insurance space, okay? That's a fantastic end game for, for many people, right? Mm -hmm. There are a small group, a very, very small group, actually, I have to say, of social innovators uh, who take it one step further. And the next step uh, is what we call social franchising, okay? And the idea here is that basically you take your business and you put it in a box and you let other people run with it as well. So you, you say to people, listen, I'm the number one player in crop insurance. I know exactly how crop insurance works, right? If you want to be a partner of mine in India or in Vietnam, et cetera, right? We can brand you with our brand and here is our insurance product in a box. Right. And you can now be healthy, sure, in Vietnam or whatever it might be. But for a social innovator, it's really more about spreading knowledge. Right. So franchising, literally franchising could be one way that you go from national scale to global scale. Uh, but really, it's any way in which you can package up your knowledge and basically broadcast your knowledge to the world so that other people can copy your idea or replicate your social innovation. So in the case of our insurance company, they decide that they don't want to franchise it, right? Uh, what they will do actually is, is, is market the knowledge. And so what they do is they start to write case studies on how they were able to create a new product called crop insurance, which uh, changed the game for a billion farm, you know, uh, for, for, for farmers in Bangladesh. And if you want to work out how crop insurance works, this is their knowledge. And any insurance company in the world can develop this product and work on it for others, right? So this is what Muhammad Yunus did when he popularized the concept of micro insurance. He created a, a, a bank that would provide micro loans to women borrowers in Bangladesh, right? But when he scaled up, he didn't go about it by launching Grameen Bank in Vietnam and all these other places, although they do now exist, obviously. No, he created the micro insurance industry by telling other people how to do it. And, and becoming the ambassador of the idea. And so that's a way, a very classic way in which social innovators spread their knowledge uh, to as many people as possible, is they, they basically share their knowledge in different ways. They consult, they open source, uh, you know. So our, our health insurance company goes to the Stanford Social Innovation Review, one of the most, uh, you know, prestigious uh, uh, journals in this space. And they give them all the case study on how to do this, and, and, it pub and that's published. And now there's hundreds of replicants around the world uh, developing crop insurance products. And so that is their path to massive scale is, is to sharing the knowledge. So, so that really is the, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the third stage is scaling up. You first, you, you do it yourself. And then at a certain stage, you, you, you teach others how to do it, or you give your business in a box and they franchise it off you, or they pay you a license or whatever it might be, right? There are many different ways you can do this. And, and Ashoka is very, very good at, you know, at talking about scaling strategies you know, for social innovation. And at this point, what kind of team do, uh, do you have? It's not the jazz band anymore, right? And it's certainly not the inventors in the lab. Um, now it's the marching band, all right? Um, it, it is everybody is singing from the sim, same music sheet and everyone is marching in step, producing the product in exactly the way that you have now perfected, right? And, uh, and, and, and who funds the scaling space? Um, three major types of funders. There are strategic investors who come alongside you, maybe other insurance companies in other countries, and they invest in a joint venture. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, it's venture capital, private equity. That's what they're designed for. They are waiting for products and services to emerge from the uh, commercialization phase. 
to invest in. And what they're looking for is, 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 is people who are ready to scale, right? And finally, uh, and, and as always the case with entrepreneurs, uh, your, your organization is, is always the funder of first resort, right, for this. So hopefully you've now taken it from prototype to commercialize, to scale. And hopefully you've been, you know, the, 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 the originator of this product or service for impact. And that is, and, and, and so, you know, your organization, we hope, will be along, for, you know, throughout this journey. But by this phase, you should be opening it up. You should be bringing in other partners and saying, will you join venture with us so we can really grow this, right? You could be, you should be spinning this off. You should be IPOing this, whatever it might be. Your organization should now be going beyond you to multiple, multiple partners, right? In order to do this, right? And so that's really um, uh, my, my presentation. Uh, you know, just to recap, think about every social venture, every social innovation, whether it's entrepreneur or intrapreneur, going through these three phases, the prototype phase, commercialize, and then scale. Remember the, uh, the different subgroups within that, right? First, validate your impact, then validate whether the customer will buy it, right? Then customize your product with a handful of early stage customers. Then standardize your product once you know what they want. And then you're ready for mass production. And finally, let it go into the world through social franchising, right? And that is how you take a tiny acorn of an idea and grow it into a global movement, right? And you know, at Ashoka and at Social Innovation Circle and elsewhere, we've seen this done hundreds of times, and this is how you do it. This is this is these every organization that I've ever worked with successfully has gone through these six stages. If you break it out into these phases, you will know exactly what you're trying to do at each phase, and and it will help you avoid those classic three mistakes that I mentioned at the beginning. Right, building a product that no one wants, scaling a product before you're ready and pitching to the wrong funder at the wrong stage, okay? So, so I find this a very helpful framework. I hope you do too. And, uh, and, and very happy to go for uh, some questions on this. Thank you so much, Mark. That was incredible, incredible insights. Um, I'm going to ask you a question with regard to scaling, uh, which is a very fundamental question. Is, it, is scaling an option or a uh, kind of a choice? Uh, it's uh, it's actually a choice. <laughs> so um, I, I, again, I think one of the problem is that so many of us are obsessed with growth, right? I mean, you know, we're obsessed. We're told by funders all the time: <laughs> if you don't reach a million customers, you're not going to change the world, or, or whatever okay. it might be. And one of the things that you know I always try and and, and tell people is that actually, no. Um, every idea, every business venture, we, of course, you want to achieve a minimum level of scale, right? But there's also an idea of an optimum level of scale as well, right? Not every mm -hmm. restaurant wants to be McDonald's. Uh, there are some that are very happy just to be a three Michelin star restaurant, you know, in their town or city that is the number one in what they do, right? And so I think there's a natural level of scale for an idea. And I think it's up to the team to work out what that, what that moment is. And don't feel that every idea has to be a global movement or, or you know, or a global franchise. It doesn't, um, uh, you know, and that's one of the differences, I think, between, you know, what I advise people and, 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 and what you might hear elsewhere. But I personally believe there is an optimum scale. And I think that it's up to the founders to, to determine what that scale is. Great. Thank you. Well, we have a lot of questions coming up, but just in the interest of time, let's take uh, some of them very quickly. So, Mark, you've um, seen a lot of uh, social entrepreneurs and nonprofits pitch. You have helped them raise millions of dollars. You've also worked with social entrepreneurs, and you're also part of making more health design. So, with that said, what is the difference between pitching for an entrepreneurial project and that of an entrepreneurial project? This is a question that has come from a lot of participants, and right. they also wanted to know if there is a framework that can be applied when pitching inside an institution. Sure. Um, so uh, there are similarities and there are differences, right? The similarities are that at the end of the day, you have to convince somebody uh, 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 to back you, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, whether that is an, an external investor in the case of an entrepreneur or whether it's an internal investor, i.e. your investment committee or your, or your management team in the case of an entrepreneur, you have to pitch your idea. So uh, what I hope is that this life cycle of a social business concept uh, is a framework that will help you make the right pitch at the right stage. So at the prototype stage, uh, whether you're pitching to an entrepreneur, uh, sorry, an investor or, or an internal investor, 
Uh, mm -hmm. It's always, please, would you support me so I can R and D this idea, so I can test it out, and and and, and you know, and 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 the and the, and it's always, I will come back to you with the validation of, of, of whether to proceed to the next step. Okay, so don't pitch for funding to scale up to a million customers. Don't even promise that, right? Just pitch for some funding in order to experiment, right? And then in the commercialization phase, what you're doing is you're saying, I need to, some funding or some support to work out um, how to create a, a standardized product that will delight most customers, right? Um, and again, you, do, you don't want to promise too much and, 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 that, and that's the basis of that. And the, finally, the scaling phase, exactly the same, right? You, you, you're pitching for now for faith, um, but for phasing up your, your, your innovation based on a, a lot of market validation that by that stage you've hopefully received. So the only difference is that um, I, I would say is that when you're pitching as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you have more flexibility in what you pitch for. It doesn't have to be just money. It can be internal resources. It can be access to the marketing team. It can be access mm -hmm. to internal operations. Um, it can be volunteer support and so on, right? So imagine that you are embedded in a corporate ecosystem as an entrepreneur, and that gives you a lot of flexibility. So that's number one. Number two is, Every entrepreneur is embedded in a company that has unique strengths and, and advantages, right? So if you're in an insurance company, you know, and you're trying to bring an insurance product to market, get access to the actuarial team, get access to the, you know, all the, all the internal resources that you've got. And so I think that an entrepreneur has a lot of advantages over an entrepreneur when it comes to raising funding because, uh, and, and getting backing, because you don't start from zero. You start from your home base, which is the company that you're, you work for, right? And so you have a unique opportunity to create win-win propositions for the company as well. You know, let's try this out. And if we succeed, we just opened up a new product, crop insurance for a new market, farmers in Bangladesh, right? That could be very exciting for your, for your management and, and it should be, you know? So it's always gonna be a win-win situation. Uh, and, and hopefully as an entrepreneur, you should be able to, to find those, that, those, those gaps, you know, that those niches to pitch. Great. All right. There was another question, which is about uh, what are the different partners and co-workers that people should be uh, looking at different stages, which you already explained in great details. No. There is a part of that question that says that who should be avoided? Can you talk a little bit about who are the people or who are the like you know, in partnerships who should be avoided in these mm. stages? Okay, uh, I think that's a, a really good question. I, I'm going to just answer one very narrow version of that, if I may, which mm -hmm. is that um, I think one of the big mistakes is to get investors involved too early on, right? So a lot of people try to bring in investors before in the prototype stage. And I think that's totally the wrong place to bring an investor in because uh, they, they, the reason they do so is because they think they have to persuade the investor first before they advance, right? And so if, if they can't raise investment, how can I possibly run a prototype and do all these things, right? <laughs> but the reason that's a mistake is because the investor is the last person to ask, right? I mean, you know, I'm an investor, you know, ask me, you know, what prototype should I run for, for an insurance company in Bangladesh, right? Uh, don't, for goodness sake, don't take my answer because I'm the most ignorant person on, on that topic. And you should, you know, ask an investor, you're going to get the wrong answer, I guarantee. Right? Um, so, so, so instead, uh, uh, only bring the investor in after you've spoken to the customer. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so the customer is the most important person by far. And in fact, I wouldn't even speak to anybody else until you've spoken to literally 100 customers. Right? Okay. You know, and, uh, and uh, you know, because by that point, if you get 100 customers saying, we are desperate for your insurance product, right? Which investor is going to say no to that, right? At that point, that's the only question that an investor should be asking is, is what do the customers say, right? Um, and, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, uh, don't avoid the investor too early on. Only speak to the investor after you've spoken to the first customers, right? Not not sold to the first customers, but spoken to the first customers and got that validation that we're looking for. And again, that will help you to, to raise uh, funding much, much faster, right? Because you won't be trapped by this uh, question, which always comes up for the early stage is, how do you know this idea is going to work, right? And, and the only way you know is if you've spoken to some customers first. Right. Thank you, Mark. We are going to go a couple of minutes overboard, so don't mind uh, all the participants, but just one last question, which is very interesting, is what is the main challenge of each phase? Under a minute, if you can just quickly summarize what are the main challenges in each of the phases? Oh, okay. Uh, so um, 
uh, let, let me let me twist that slightly and, and say let let me explain why I think it's very helpful to to to, to think in these three phases, right? So it, the reason why I offer this framework is because each phase is trying to force you to avoid making a mistake, okay? <laughs> so the reason why I'm saying prototype before you commercialize is because uh, the mistake to make is to come up with an idea too quick and get into production of that idea before you even know whether people want it or not. So that's why we do prototyping, right? Yeah. Is, uh, is, 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 is test your idea and test several versions of the idea uh, before you get too advanced, right? So, and don't spend too much money on it either and spend too much time on it either, right? Prototyping should be very cheap and very quick, right? And, and, and get out quickly if, if every customer says, sorry, we just don't want this, right? Yeah. So prototyping is all about avoiding big mistakes, which is spending too much money too early, you know, too, you know, early on building the wrong product. The reason why we do the commercialization phase before the scaling phase is because there's so much you've got to work out before you, you can get to the scaling phase, right? So again, the mistake we're trying to avoid is coming up with a business plan to reach a million customers before you've worked out exactly what the product should, should be, you know, how it should work, right? So, so that, that, is, that is a very, very common mistake. In fact, I would say that most people make that mistake, okay? So that, that, is, that is the, you know, uh, that's, that, that's the mistake we're trying to avoid. And then the scaling phase, of course, is, is, is if you get to through all that, that, then you're ready for the scaling phase. And so what I find myself doing as an investor and as a, as a coach is trying to persuade people to hold back from scaling up too quickly. Don't try and rush into growth. Don't try and get VC money, uh, you know, in the first five years even of your project, right? Seriously. Um, uh, and, 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 and so if, if you are very disciplined about these three phases, uh, I think you can avoid 90% of the mistakes that cause people to blow up, right? And, and so that's why I'm very excited by this framework uh, is, is because I think it's a very powerful way to, uh, 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 to, to avoid very, very basic mistakes that everybody makes, uh, you know, to be quite honest. Uh, so, uh, so hopefully your audience will find that. And, and, you know, I'd love people's feedback and thoughts on this process. Thank you so much, Mark, for all your wisdom and seasoned insights. Sadly, we are moving to the end of the session. We are already two minutes open. So thank you so much for your time, Mark. Uh, Mark, could you briefly tell us how anybody can enroll for courses that you run or how somebody can invite you as a speaker? Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure delivering this workshop. And if um, people who are watching this uh, have found this content helpful or useful to you, um, I offer many more workshops and, 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 and frameworks and content like this uh, based on, you know, my experience of working for many, many years with social innovators, both entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs around, around doing this. So uh, you're very, very welcome to reach out to me. And I, I'm always happy to uh, offer training services and coaching uh, uh, to teams that, 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 that want this. Um, the best way to find me is on LinkedIn. Uh, 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 so Mark Cheng is my name, C-H-E-N-G. Uh, my team is called Social Innovation Circle, and my website is www.socialinnovationcircle.com. Uh, uh, so please reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn if you want. Uh, for those of you who are active on social media, I I'm pretty active on Twitter <laughs> if you want. Uh, you can reach me at markch3ng. Uh, markch3ng is my username, so just feel free to ping me at any time. I'm always happy to respond to people and, you know, and, and so forth. Uh, and we're really happy to offer training, uh, you know, and further support or, or like, or like this on any aspect of social innovation development, business model development, or fundraising for social impact uh, is, is three areas in particular that we're very happy to talk to Ashoka fellows, change maker entrepreneurs, uh, companies that, that want to do more corporate social innovation and so forth. Uh, you know, and it's a great pleasure um, uh, presenting uh, this workshop and other workshops like this on this course, because I, I, I've been doing this now in Johnny with you uh, and the team for, for several years. And uh, it's always such a rich audience to, to come and work with, you know, such an you know, incredible group of people. Um, so thank you to the people who are, who are watching and listening to this. And, and, and please do connect with me if you uh, want to continue the conversation. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks. What you taught us is going to go a long way for us to apply in our lives and benefit from it. So thank you very, very much. 
And thank you everyone for joining us live and thank you for your active participation in asking so many relevant questions. Once again, thank you for your uh, assignment submissions for module four. This week, we will look forward to your assignments for module five so that we can review it, do engage in giving feedback to your peers. And don't forget to join us for to uh, tomorrow for the facilitators office hours at 10 a.m. ET. We look forward to hearing from you your experience of the course. Remember, this is an interactive session, so do join us. Till then, enjoy the course.